Good afternoon and welcome to a, another uh, astounding session of ENG4E Term 2A brought to you by Wassa Distance Education Center. And of course, yours truly, your instructor, Mike Laverty. Hope everything is great where you are. Things are feeling not too bad here in Sulaco, although we do have a large weather system looming onto us, just like it is the most of northern Ontario. So hopefully you can stay safe and stay warm out there. Today's date is Tuesday, April the 4th, 2023. And today's date marks class 29 of our 34 classes together. So we will have 34 classes in total. And today is number 29. So getting pretty close to having this one wrapped up. But as I mentioned last week, I felt that we didn't devote enough time to going over the novel where the rivers meet. So I want to spend uh, most of this week, if not all of it, doing what we call the novel study. And we already did some of this going back into Unit 2. So Unit 2 is is delves into the, the novel and about 90% of the questions in Unit 2 d are, are about the, the novel, Where the Rivers Meet. But I wanted to just spend more time talking about the novel because A, we didn't give it enough time, and B, there will be some questions on the final exam. So hint, hint, I've already mentioned this before, but uh, yeah, there, there will definitely be some questions about this novel on the final exam. So you need to have a, a deep understanding of this novel, be able to talk about it, you know, j to simply answer your assignment questions from Unit 2, but to also be successful on the final exam. So here's some announcements. There will, uh, we are in week 8 of Term 2A. There'll be no class on Monday forgot to put the date in there. That's Monday, I believe it's the 10th. Let's just see here. Look at my calendar. Yeah. So Monday, April 10th, there'll be, there'll be no class. And they'll, well, we're, we're also closed on, the WASA office is closed on Good Friday, which is, which is coming up. That's, that's this Friday. April the 7th. So we are closed Good Friday, April the 7th, 2023. Our office will be closed, and we don't normally broadcast on Fridays, but we do broadcast on Mondays, and Monday, April 10th, there will be no broadcast. We'll meet back on Tuesday the 11th, where we will continue on with the final week of classes. April 11th also marks the final uh, date for registering for term 2B. That's the final term, so if you want to register for courses in term 2B, then do that on April the 11th. And June 15th is, of course, our graduation day. So I want to once again give a reminder to everybody out there on the airwaves that you have to keep that graduation date in f in your mind, first and foremost, right? So You've got about two and a half months to complete your course work. It's not a lot of time, so you you got to you got to be realistic about that, right? So if you haven't started a course and it's the only course you have to do, and you've got a couple hours every night, then yes, by all means, you can finish off a course. You can get a credit if you haven't started yet. If you have started and you are submitting assignments. You know, if, if you're halfway there, right, if, if you've done about half the work in this course, then, you know, you've still got about five, six weeks to go, realistically, right? So just keep that in mind as you, as you progress, right? So, and you, and you, once again, I mentioned this last week, but you can't pass on your credits. Sorry, you can't pass on your coursework from school year to school year. So whatever you did this school year can't be just transferred over to next year. You've got to get it done now, right? So don't wait until next year. If you put the time in, push through to the end, and there are many, many people at our organization, at WASA, who would love to help you.
can get you all kind of supports you need. So that's what we're here for. So with that in mind, I've got the course schedule up and we've done units one, two, three, and four and all of the culminating activities. And now we're on to our novel study. And once we've talked about the novel for a few a few classes, then we can go into the final exam. So if you're listening to us live, thanks for tuning in. ENG4E, Grade 12 Workplace Preparation English, broadcasts every Monday to Thursday, 2 p.m. to 2.50 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can phone us in the studio at 1-807-737-4017, or you can phone in the toll-free number at 1-800-465-7144. That's 91.9 FM or Bell Express View Channel 972. And you can also find us on Zoom by opening up the Zoom application on a smart device or going to zoom.us, clicking the join button and entering on a four digit, sorry, a 10 digit number, 417 6699 799. You can reach me through email at m-l-a-v-e-r-t-y at n-n-e-c-s-c-h-o-o-l-s dot o-r-g. Once again, that's mlaverty at n-n-e-c-schools.org. Find me on Facebook at Laverty Space Wassa. So add me as a friend, ask me questions, send me assignments on Messenger, or phone the Wassa office directly at one 807 Seven three seven one four eight eight extension two two one one, or toll free at one eight hundred six six seven three seven zero three. If you don't know who to talk to, you can just dial zero, talk to a receptionist, especially if you have any help, if you need any help with your path to graduation, or any other questions you might have about your, you know, getting the credits you need and signing up for the courses you need and finding out what's next for you. And just seeing if you if you if you're on a realistic timeline to to get your credits in this school year. And as a suggested timeline, if you've been if you've put in seven weeks in this course, seven weeks should be enough time to read the study guide, read the units, read the novel, complete all the assignments in the first three units, and start working on assignments in unit four. So I want to give you a, a general timeline how long these things should take. All right, so we will start today's lesson with our words of the day. So I've got some words of the day, and we will also look at our novel study. So today we're going to look at, ah, not chapter four. That's a a mistake on my part. Chapter eight. So our words of the day and our novel study will be focused on chapter eight. We'll review the elements of style. Ah, I, I did that same mistake as last last time. We'll review the elements of narrative as we take a, a closer look at chapter eight of Where the Rivers Meet. And our success criteria for today will be to, you know, we're gonna we're gonna practice our we're gonna we're gonna practice our reading skills. through the elements of style, right? Elements of narrative, right? The elements of style is a book. The elements of narrative is what we're talking about today. So we're practicing our reading skills through the elements of style, and we are, let's see, we are... So if you can do that, if you can practice the your reading skills by reviewing the elements of narrative and analyze a novel. Analyze a novel and you know take notes. And so when we when we analyze something, when we take it apart, we look at it through its different pieces and then we see how those different pieces kind of come together 
and how they how they come to make a whole as as the novel right so you know and you know what kind of impact does this novel have on us as readers how does each paragraph fit in to make a chapter how do all the chapters fit in together so up on the board i've got two anishinaabe moan words on the second day of the week i like to infuse my lecture with a a couple of words from the in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe Moan language and try to tie them in with our discussion. So the two words I chose for today, um, the first one is 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 uh, is, uh, is Nujimo, which is she or he heals, recovers from an illness. The second word is um, Nujimohiwe, and that is she or he cures people or she or he heals people. And I would I would argue that these words apply to our protagonist. And remember, a protagonist is another word for the main character or the hero. So the hero of our story, Nancy Antoine, or uh, Nancy Antoine, is is someone who herself recovers from um, an illness or a tragedy and trauma. So she herself heals. And then as the novel ends, as we'll see as we explore the later chapters, she helps other people. I think she heals other people. You know, but once she's, but she first has to figure out herself and she first has to work on herself before she can then go out and heal other people. And I think that's, you know, when you're, when you're on an airplane, the, the flight attendants will often give the speech, you know, in, in, in the unfortunate circumstance that the oxygen mask uh, falls from the you know the upper compartment and as a passenger you've got to put on your your air mask they always recommend you know put your mask on first before you worry about anybody else right so if you've got kids your instinct might be to put theirs on first or if you're traveling with like a someone with limited capacity that can't help themselves they've got mobility or mental issues the instinct might be to help them but they say, you know, help yourself, make sure you're safe and you're secure, and then you're in a position to help somebody else. All right, and my English word of the day I is trauma, which is a, a word I think you're hearing more and more in the, in the news these days. And I, I think that people are getting a greater understanding uh, of what the word trauma means. And I've certainly done a lot of research on it. I find it to be uh, pretty fascinating. I, I think that the old school way of looking at trauma is like, you know, trauma is being in a car accident. Trauma is, you know, being robbed at gunpoint. It's, it w it, trauma was usually reserved for like really life-shattering, violent episodes in someone's life. And that definition is still true to this day. But I think, you know, trauma is also just, just um, going through grief and having people close to you die unexpectedly and you know all of these things they, they, they cause trauma in your life and they and they have a you know and they and they have a huge impact on your life and if you don't learn how to deal with them it has lots of fallout and it has lots of consequences so I think that Nancy is a young high school student who herself has experienced much trauma and then throughout the course of this novel we see that she's she's she suffers even more trauma and what she does with that is really the at, at the heart of the story you know what she does with her own trauma what she does to help other people who are experiencing it so the word itself is, is, a, is a noun and the the dictionary definition divides it into two sections the first one is pathology uh, and, and they say that trauma is a body wound or shock produced by sudden physical injury as from violence or accident, the condition produced by this, or psychiatric trauma, an experience that produced physiological injury or pain, uh, sorry, that produced psychological injury or pain or the psychological injury so caused, right? So we can, we can be experienced by trauma in a physical way where our bodies are severely hurt or, you know, damaged in some way and then we can experience trauma in a, in a in a psychological setting so our minds can be affected 
And, and sometimes the, the physical trauma you experience will lead to the mental trauma, right? So if someone uh, has to have an arm amputated after a workplace injury, right, that physical experience could then lead to some mental trauma if they don't get proper counseling. And, you know, many, many soldiers who, who go to war, you know, we, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. They go to war and they might sustain an injury and that injury will lead to them having poor mental health or just the risk of, of being injured will do that too. And, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I think it's relevant to the, to the novel. Any, any human being that never gets a chance to relax, that never gets to be off, if, if they feel that they're always, they're always on and they have to look out for danger, so we're talking about like young people growing up in poor neighborhoods that are run by gangs or they go to really aggressive, violent schools, um, or of course thinking about residential schools and the poor young kids who had to go to those schools, they would they would have experienced uh, like textbook PTSD, and and it's very similar to being in a war zone because uh, just like a soldier never gets to relax, and a soldier is always in that heightened state of like, what do I have to do to survive? Who's coming to get me? What what's what's out there in the world that's going to get me? What do I have to do to prevent that from happening? You know, kids in residential schools and situations like that are, you know, they're just they're just experiencing trauma all the time. And, and they never get a chance to deal with it. It just gets worse and worse and it piles on. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of what I think about when, when I think about our protagonist, Nancy, right? She was passed on a lot of trauma from her mom and her dad. And it, it, just, it just makes her all the more amazing a, as a character for someone who, who takes on this, this healing journey of hers. All right, so I, before we, we, we talk about the novel and, and I read some excerpts from it, I want to talk about the guided reading questions. So the guided reading questions for today's chapter, chapter 8. The first one is, is question 25. What is George's main concern when he comes by to see Nancy at their house? So let's keep that in mind. Why is George there? Who is old Mrs. Schmidt? What does Nancy's father have in mind when he mentions her name? And 27, what is symbolic about the purpose of the bear's tooth, the, bear to the bear's tooth necklace, which Nancy's father gives her at the end of the chapter? So if we, if we look on the, the cover of the book, we have our protagonist, Nancy, and she's got a jean jacket. She's holding some school books or like what, what appears to be a binder and a textbook. And she has that bear tooth necklace around her neck. So, so what's the purpose of that necklace? You know, why... Why is that important? What purpose does it serve in the story, at least in chapter 8? All right, so chapter 8. Actually, no, before we do that, I want to just go over these elements of style. So, so you do need to write chapter reflections too. So what you're doing is you're picking any six chapters to talk about. So you may want to pick chapter 8 um, after, I, after I give my thoughts on it. You might get some more insights into it. So you're writing a chapter reflection on it, and then what I suggest is it, it is a reflection, so it, it's just your thoughts on it, and so you're either making connections with the text, you're making connections to your own life, or you know, you're just simply talking about the text, or you're talking about how the text makes you think about something else, or you're talking about how this chapter relates to something that helps happen earlier in the chapter or might happen later. Things like that, okay? And I also suggest that you, you talk about one or more of the elements of narrative, right? So talk about the plot, character, setting, theme, conflict. So you could pick one of those elements and just see how it's developed in one of these chapters. And if you can, I think it helps if you can, you know, make connections with your own life. Tell me what this chapter made you think about. And you can also identify specific lines from the chapter. So you can quote a specific line of dialogue or a specific description of nature, for example, or just something that something that w that went through Nancy's mind or, you know, a, a word or a sentence or a way something was described, you know, just write that down, highlight it and discuss it. 
in your writing. All right, so again, we're looking at the elements of narrative, and they include characters, plot. So characters, simply the people in the story. The p sorry, the people involved in the plot. The plot is the events or scenes that happen. So this is surface level. This is just simply what happens, not why it happened or what deep implications it has and how it develops certain themes. So plot is just simply what happens. The setting is where and when the plot occurred. So conflict is the problems or problems facing the main character. So what is the conflict? And, th and there's usually more, sometimes there's more than one conflict. And then what's the theme here? What's the deeper meaning of the story beneath the plot, right? So going beyond or, you know, what's the deeper, what's the, what's the moral of the story? What do we, what do we learn from Nancy, right? And, and this is often not said by the, by the author. The author isn't going to tell you the theme of the book. The, this doesn't usually happen. There might be some book club questions at the end, and there may be a description of the book, but the author will rarely, you know, if ever, say, the theme of my book is this. It's y you get the theme by reading it and paying attention. And you can just think about, you know, examples of movies, right? You know, the theme is, uh, you know, it, it's it's deeper than that, right? So, like, you could take, like, fantasy and sci-fi, like, Harry Potter, Star Wars, you know. The plot of these movies is, is fantastical, and it's other worlds and alien civilizations and the Force, or it's wizards and spells and stuff like that. That's That's the plot. That's what happens. But the theme of those novels are, are much deeper, right? Harry Potter, Star Wars, you know, Batman. I'm just, just thinking about the really big blockbuster ones. The themes of those movies are often, you know, it takes a little bit to really understand what they are, right? A lot of them are about self-identity and, and transformation and having an alter ego and... You know, uh, you know, fighting, fighting, fighting evil. You know, and, and the complications of doing so. Those are examples of like themes. So as chapter eight opens, the the reserve that Nancy lives in, and the town of Creighton, and the people they are, they are. They're dealing with the death of Barry. So this is this is George's best friend, Barry, who's also a close friend of Nancy, and he has uh, committed suicide. And sh Nancy is is dealing with that, and so she's dealing with the trauma uh, of losing a friend in this way. You know, so. Barry's been a very aggressive guy, and he's clearly been dealing with some issues. And then earlier, in one of the earlier chapters, he confesses to Nancy that he did something really horrible in his youth, and he's been dealing with it ever since. And I think the shame and the guilt kind of gets to him, and he unfortunately decides to, to end his life. So, so Nancy is dealing with that. Um, you know, Nancy is, is dealing with that. So I just want just to give you a heads up. We, we won't be talking about what happened to Barry specifically, you know, I if suicide something that's affected you in your life, you, you may want to, you know, reach out to someone, uh, talk to someone. I mentioned that when we started this novel that there, there are several kind of trigger warnings in this book. And so just to be prepared that that's, that's what we're talking about. And if you feel like you're not in a place to, to hear that in the moment, then you may want to take a break or look out for supports or maybe um, you know, contact the WASA office, contact myself, and just to find ways that you can kind of deal with that and complete the, the assignments. So chapter 8 opens on page 65. Nancy lay in bed until noon each day, watching the hands on the clock on her bedside table crawl in a slow circle. When she tried to get up, the warmth of the blankets and the softness of the pillow drew her back into easy oblivion. When she was finally sick of spending hour after hour drifting in and out of sleep, she dragged herself into the kitchen and sat heavily on an old vinyl-covered chair. Moving the twenty feet from her bedroom to the kitchen seemed to drain her, and she sat staring blankly out the small window above the sink. She had never felt like this. A terrible listlessness, 
seized her and left her limp empty. She didn't even feel the warmth of the mug of coffee her father pressed into her hands and was ob she was oblivious to the concern written across her face. She spent hours on the back porch looking blankly out over the edge of the bench to the mountains. Nothing registered. The vivid greens of the pines, the patches of grass, and the new leaves of the alders and Saskatoons, hazed gray and dull, and the dramatic backdrop of the mountains beyond the river was flat and indistinct. The chittering of the birds, the soughing of the wind through the trees, and even the growing warmth of the spring sun went unnoticed as Nancy shivered in the shadows thrown by the porch roof. All right, so so that's that's really important, um, just the way we're describing this. So when when we're talking about the setting of this chapter, we can talk about Nancy's Nancy's house. And we can talk about her view, you know, her view of nature uh, from the porch. And if we go into, you know, conflict, you know, we have, you know, Nancy. Nancy feeling disconnected, right? Disconnected from the world. You know, as the as the story opened, Nancy is already feeling disconnected and she's already having these feelings where she's she she clearly loves nature and she's she's always thinking about nature and looking at landscapes and comparing them to paintings and uh, if, if you think back to her descriptions from the first chapter about the raging rivers and how they come together. So she's, she clearly loves nature and she loves the, the environment she lives in. But in the opening of chapter 8, she doesn't feel that. She's disconnected. There's, there's a division there. She's, she can't connect with her world. She's feeling alone. She's feeling isolated. And she's feeling kind of numb. Often she cried for no apparent reason. There were no particular thoughts she was aware of. Indeed, her whole head seemed clogged with sawdust. She moved and spoke without reflection or awareness, and the tears seemed to spring out of her eyes with astonishing spontaneity. Sometimes she would merely glance at her father, bent over his carving, and she would start weeping. Other times she would be rocking in the old rocking chair on the porch and would feel her throat close up and tears sting her eyes as great waves of sadness swept through her. Sometimes a memory of Barry laughing in the bar or the angry face of Quigley, that's her teacher, would trigger the heaving emotions. Other times she would be Barry on the bridge, hesitating, then leaping. Often it was a deeper sadness, the sadness over some great incalculable loss that she could neither define or comprehend. It welled up inside her like a black wind that rushed through her, leaving her feeling more empty and desolate than she had ever felt before. And then we learn that her, her father is trying to, to talk to her and they have a conversation in this chapter. You know, um, he tries to talk to her, tries to knock on her door and she doesn't really listen to him. But on the third morning, he knocked on her door and entered the bedroom. Aren't you going to school today? He felt nervous and awkward, uncertain about what to say or do. He ran his big brown hands through his hair. Nancy, you got to go to school. Nancy didn't even turn over. No, Papa, I don't. I'm not going back there. But you can't just quit, he said, his deep flat, but deep, flat voice betraying his worry. You're too close to finishing. Yeah, I can, Nancy murmured. And you don't know how far away from finishing I really am. I'm miles away, centuries away. Her voice trailed off into muffled sobs as she pressed her face into the pillow. So that brings us to another conflict. So you've got, um, you know, We've got Nancy struggling to to graduate high school. And I think, you know, ultimately this is what we call a, a coming of age story. It's a, it's very classical. There's there's been, you know, thousands of of novels written like this it's a very common way to write a novel 
it you know it's about a adolescent a, a teenage person and they are becoming themselves they're becoming an adult they they're no longer a child but they are you know so th they have a little bit of childhood childish tendencies but for the most part they're almost an adult but they have a lot of growing up to do so but that's one of the struggles that she has right He looked at the thin body shaking under the covers and he wanted to reach out to her. But his hand hesitated, then halted, and slowly dropped back to his side. Is it because of Barry? Is that why you're so sad? He asked softly. There was a long silence until finally the crying tapered off. I don't know, Papa, Nancy answered feebly. No, yes, I don't know. Barry and you and them and us, I don't know. I, I wish I could do something. He looked helplessly around the room as if he might find the words hidden somewhere. I don't know what to say. So he simply goes back to his, his carving. And then shortly after that, uh, on the next day, George arrives. This is Nancy's friend, George. Nancy, he said gently, what's going on? You haven't been to school for three days. Maria Adams said you had an argument with Quigley and walked out of school. Why didn't you talk to me? Nancy felt suddenly moved by the hurt and the concern in his voice. She closed her eyes, and tears spilled slowly down her cheeks. I'm sorry, she whispered. It was hard to talk, and the words came in gas. I didn't talk to anyone except Bernice. That's uh, Bernice Wu, her home economics teacher. I came right home, and I haven't felt like going anywhere since. Now her weeping turned to sobs, and she buried her face in her hands, leaning forward in the chair. He came to her and put his arm around her shivering shoulders, drawing her close. He held her tenderly until the moans and sobs subsided at last. Finally, she raised her wet face and looked at him with red, swollen eyes. I'm sorry, George. For what? He asked quietly. For crying and staying in bed, for being scared and angry, for being lost and lonely, for being so afraid. George rocked her back and forth. Hey, there's no reason for being sorry for all that. We all feel that way sometimes. But listen, Nancy, what are you going to do? You can't stay here forever. You've got to do something, like going back to school. Damn you, George. If all you came here was to act like a truant officer, you can just go right now. George got up, anger flashing in his own eyes. All you've ever talked about since I've known you is how you want to get through school and leave this place. Now you are here. Now you are. Less than three months from finishing, and you're throwing it all away. I can't let you do that. And how do you propose to stop me, Nancy demanded. Are you going to club me and drag me and by the hair up to the school each day? Maybe you can handcuff me to my desk. This is my life and I'll do what I want with it. Understand? The two glared at each other for a few seconds. Then George's eyes softened. What do you want to do with it then? He asked. She looked towards the mountains. I don't know, she whispered. I just don't want to end up like Barry. George reached over, held her hand, and said, Then don't. But you can't just hibernate. You have to do something. Don't go back to school now, but you've got to find something to snap you out of this. Okay, she says, I will. And so George leaves. Um, another, another, another three days passed. Um, once back in the house where her father was drinking coffee, she realized that he hadn't had any alcohol in the three days she'd been home. Now he sat near the crackling warmth of the stove and stared absently out the door she had just entered. So her father is a um, is an alcoholic, but he has stopped drinking these these past three days. And then Nancy and her father have an interaction. Um, Pop, she said quietly, "I'm sorry. I've I've been moping around here for the past four days. I'm just I'm just not sure what to do." After Barry's death, things stopped making sense. Or they never did make sense, and I just began to realize it. Anyway, I feel kind of lost, you know? School has always been meaningless, but now it seems even more ridiculous. I just can't go through that charade right now, so I don't know where to turn or what to do. And then he says, me, uh, you know, she, and then she, I'm sorry too. I'm sorry, honey. I don't know how to help. Maybe I should go away, travel for a while, Nancy continued. Maybe go to Vancouver and get a job for a while. Maybe, her father said. Or maybe, like Bernice said, it's all right here. Maybe I can figure things out without leaving, but I just don't know how. And it's at that point, so her, her father ha has really struggled with with helping her. And, you know, just speaking from experience as a parent, you know, if you've got a young person 
or a young adult in this case who's suffering with grief and trauma and you don't know how to help them. It could be feeling really powerless. So her dad doesn't know how to help her. But then he realizes that, you know, maybe you should you you should you should talk to someone. You you should you should learn from someone. You know, he says he says the elders are gone and no one goes on spirit quest, but he thinks that that's, that's what she needs. And then he finally settles upon old Cecile Schmidt. And when Nancy hears that name, her face fell. Old Mrs. Schmidt lived by herself about a mile down the river from them in a little red house on the edge of a tiny bench. So when they say bench, I it means like a, like a long, flat stretch of land. That's sort of like, it's sort of like a foothill to, to like a mountain, right? So people rarely saw her, and when they did, she was generally scowling. Some of the people used to whisper that she was a witch, and when Nancy was young, kids used to dare each other to go knock on her door. I'm not going over there, Nancy could remember squealing. She might turn me into a raven. Nancy had called her old Mrs. Schmidt ever since she could remember, and though she looked about 50, she never seemed to age. Now Nancy figured she had to be at least 75. Pop, Nancy protested. I don't want to get mixed up with old Mrs. Schmidt. She's, she's spooky. Her father just smiled. She's not so bad. She just keeps to herself. She grew up with her parents, her grandparents, and she only went to residential school for a few years when she was older. I don't know why. Um, maybe her grandparents hit her, or maybe they needed her at home. Anyway, she grew up with her grandparents right where she lives now. And then they sort of make a plan, right? So uh, Nancy makes a joke asking if Mrs. Old Schmidt is a witch. Her father chuckles. When we were kids, the nuns used to tell us her grandparents were heathens because they didn't go to church. But I never saw Cecile flying around on a broomstick. Can she, you know, change people? You mean into something else? Now it was Nancy's turn to grin. I know that sounds ridiculous, but that's kind. That's what the kids used to say. I only heard of Coyote doing that, her father replied, his face brightening at the moment of legends learned long ago and almost forgotten. Nancy paused again. Now her coffee was positively cold. She set it down on the table. Okay, maybe I'll walk over there tomorrow and pay a visit. You know, just say hello. And then once once her Nancy's father hears that, he goes back to his bedroom and he rummages around in a drawer. Soon he returns with an old bear's tooth necklace strung on a buckskin thong. He slips it around her neck. This was my great-grandfather's. The bear was his guardian spirit and gave this to him on a spirit quest. He wore it and believed it kept away evil. It was especially powerful against witchcraft, he said. Later, my father gave it to me when I was a boy, but I never paid much attention to it. Now I'm going to give it to you. You mean because of old Mrs. Schmidt? Her father smiled sheepishly. Well, you can't be too careful. And they both laugh for the first time in days. And that's how that chapter ends. So I, you know, I'm trying to pick chapters that I, th I mean, I think that like every, every chapter in this book is meaningful. And you can't take any chapter out and and have the novel make sense, but I think some chapters are a little more dispensable than others, and I think this is a very foundational chapter, a lot to unpack here. So we'll in our last uh, ten minutes or so together, we will do that. So it's it's good to understand the plot uh, of what happens, and you know we we've we've got it the the plot of this chapter. We've got Nancy waking up. You know, she's waking up feeling lost. You know, this is after after Barry's death. She is she's at home. She's at home for many days. And, of course, that means she is not attending school. She, let's see, she, a plot point here would be she speaks to her father. Uh, Barry comes over. 
and then they fight. They fight and make up, right? And that's important too, right? Because I think, you know, um, Nancy's father is having a hard time connecting with her, and he's having and he's really struggling with ways to help her. And I think, you know, if we go back to our discussion about trauma, and you know, what what happens is 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 people experience trauma, and and we all experience trauma in our lives. There's, there's no way to go through your life without experiencing any trauma. It's going to happen. It just simply can't be avoided. But I think what's 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 critical I is how you sort of deal with that trauma and, and how you release it. And from what I've read about it, the the really devastating thing is is when someone doesn't talk about it and they just internalize it and they keep it inside and they never tell anybody about it. And so I think Nancy's feelings are, are, are very understandable and her feelings are natural, but she's only going to get worse and she's only going to feel stuck if she continues to internalize it and she can't get it out and she can't talk about it. So I think Barry coming is very, very helpful it's very healing for Nancy. And even though they yell and they fight and they kind of scream at each other, that experience kind of pushes Nancy over the edge. That's what she needs. She needs something to push her over the edge where she can simply no longer hide these feelings. And then, you know, I think a weight is lifted off of her. And so th th what comes next is, you know, Nancy's dad... You know, he um, he brings up, you know, he brings up the spirit quest. And then, you know, Nancy, you know, uh, talks about, she talks about visiting. Mrs. Schmidt at the end. And then, of course, we have the necklace at the end. So it's good just to look at the plot of the novel. Uh, sorry, to look at the plot of the, of the chosen chapter that you're reflecting upon and, and just kind of break it down by what actually happened. So, again, just a, a, a quick recap. Nancy wakes up. She has these feelings of being lost after Barry's death. And, and just not just that. She's, she's really stuck. She's, everything's dark. She can't connect with nature. She's at home for several days in this chapter. She's not going to school. Uh, she does speak to her father, but, you know, they, I, sh I should add, they, they can't connect. She can't explain what's happening. You know, he knows what's wrong. Like, in, in, and, it, and it's interesting, you know, he, d he doesn't know what to say. And he asks her, like, are you sad because of Barry? And, you know, like, I think sometimes we do that. Like, we just, we don't know what to say. And then we just ask, like, really obvious questions. And that could really anger the person we're trying to help. Because we just, we just want to say something. And silence is just unbearable. So he knows it's Barry, but he has to ask anyways. But bottom line... Nancy and her dad can't connect. Barry comes over, they fight and make up. And then after that, you know, once Barry has sort of like helped Nancy and helped her deal with these emotions, she's then able to connect with her father and have some kind of a real conversation. And it's at that point that he brings up a spirit quest and brings up her talking to an elder. And that elder is, of course, old Mrs. Schmidt, right? So that's what happens in this chapter which brings me to the the th the theme of 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 the story so i th i think the theme of the story and i've talked about this in in our discussions of unit 2 back in february that i think the main the main theme of this book is is self transformation It's about the the self uh, transforming into something else, right? So, 
Inter interestingly enough, in this chapter, Nancy and her father are making jokes at old Mr. Schmidt's expense. You know, Nancy, and, and the fact that Nancy's joking is a really good sign too, right? Um, they, you know, it's wh when when people are are depressed, and they 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 have you know um, which you know depression is is definitely a, a can be a symptom of of trauma and and, and kind of holding things in. I, it's very hard to 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 see things humorously. It's very hard to enjoy jokes and comedy. It's very hard to you know, w when you're struggling with those feelings, right? So the fact that she can joke is, is, a, is a positive sign. And she jokes about, you know, being afraid that Mrs. Schmidt will turn her, into, turn her into a raven, right? And then she says, you know, does she have the power to transform people? And I think, you know, on one level it's a joke, but maybe Nancy is, like, thinking about her own transformation and can this woman kind of, like, work magic and can she change me and, and transform me into something else, right? So... I would say that the deeper theme of this story and this novel is this is the story of self transformation, um, and maybe you could add it. You know, in the in the face of tragedy, you know, a. You know, um, face of tragedy, a broken a broken society. You know, a, a damaged world. That's that's like my my biggest takeaway from reading this novel, and I and I I truly do think it's a great novel. I think it's 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 amazing that he, uh, this novel was written, you know, in the late uh, late 80s, and it's uh, definitely ahead of its time. I think it, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how many how many young adult novels were, you know, or you know, novels about young people were truly addressing residential school and trauma and things like this. So it's kind of ahead of its time, and but you know, uh, more importantly, it's you know, it, it's about Nancy you know, transforming herself and, um, a and healing, right? So again, it, there's that, so transformation, I would say self-transformation, um, and then I would say healing. And these are two um, of, I, I think of the uh, self-transformation, healing, and injustice so how does someone so young you know learn to grow up and, and to be part of a society when that society is damaged and you know how how do we grow up and become people and deal with and deal with life when we live in this sort of damaged um, world and we live in this broken society right and we you know how how do we do that in the face of tragedy and how do we not get weaker and you know i think that's it's it's the resilience uh, of of this character that that's truly that's truly inspiring right so it's i i think that you know i myself struggle with with these things and and i'm in my early 40s right and i've got a you know a relatively uh you know a fairly comfortable existence right and don't have to deal with the things that nancy deals with but yet i struggle with these things and sort of healing myself and living a good life and i think that's really what we're we're talking about when we're talking about this novel right so I i'm hoping that that sort of gives you um a bit of a different insight into nancy as a character and, and what she's been through a and then we get that by and then we and we've and we've and we've explored that by looking at these these elements of, of narrative, right? So we didn't really talk about the characters specifically, but they were involved in, in that discussion. So we'll continue our discussion of the novel tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in and we'll pick it up there.